Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, welcome back to the Nano Exploration webinars. Uh, today, we have an uh, excellent pleasure uh, to welcome Haluk Akai as the speaker. Haluk uh, is a senior graduate student in a group of Sangut Kim uh, over in mechanical engineering. And uh, he'll have a chance today to tell us how to connect mechanical to electrical properties of matter down on micro and nanoscale uh, engineer devices that indeed uh, will, in his worlds, will be able to indeed describe to you different ways of recognizing their performance at different frequencies. Um, just as a reminder, uh, if you have not attended previously Nano Explorations, the good thing to do is uh, to turn off your video and mute yourself. That way the bandwidth of the rest of us uh, will be able to more easily take Haluk's uh, uh, talk. Um, but the other thing to do is to hold your questions towards the very end. At that point, uh, using the chat functions or by raising your hand, uh, you'll be able to ask any questions you have. Without further ado, I would ask Haluk uh, to take over. Thank you, Professor Bulovic, um, for that really kind introduction. And um, I will, yeah, I would like to um, proceed. Um, my talk today is going to be on a low frequency energy harvesting uh, with, at the micro scale, just using MEMS devices. My name is Haluk, and I'm from the mechanical engineering department here. So, this photo that I'm showing you is kind of a dramatic photo, but it really nicely illustrates uh, kind of the commercial need that's motivating this research. And that is, we see right here a very long oil pipeline in a very remote part of the uh, country. And companies and people with interest in such infrastructure, they need to monitor different information along this long pipeline. Um, temperature, pressure, other types of helpful information that sort of uh, is valuable is monitored with low powered sensors that are located and distributed across this very remote region. And the motivating uh, factor for this research is to develop a way of harvesting energy, namely a uh, vibrational energy from ambient uh, sources of vibrations to then power these low powered sensors. Um, in order to be able to deliver what would otherwise be unable to uh, sort of be supplied in this remote environment or a mobile environment, uh, electric power. So the, uh, the, the design requirements, the constraints that this research is sort of operating within are that of a small size. So the device that we are um, sort of developing must be around the footprint of the sensor that it is powering. So about the size of a coin. Um, it must be able to harvest energy from the available sources of energy, in this case, very low frequency vibrations. This is uh, vibrations uh, low about 100 hertz. This can be uh, sources like an electric motor or fluid flowing through a pipe, um, even uh, the motions created by a human if they are moving in this in a sort of mobile uh, case, and um, even sort of uh, vibrations generated by vehicles passing on a roadway nearby. Um, and then we have to be able to harvest energy over a large bandwidth. And we cannot be constrained to a specific resonant frequency. We need to be able to continuously harvest energy to, uh, to supply the uh, low power sensor with electric power. And finally, the amount of power generated needs to be on the order of microwatts and sort of be able to sustain the operation of the, uh, of the application. So the, this research is really of low frequency energy harvesting in sort of for remote environments. And if you're familiar with MEMS technology, you've already maybe noticed that there's a key uh, physical challenge here. And that is overcoming the fact that linear natural resonant frequencies where uh, structures will resonate um, at a, at a um, environmental frequency is tied inversely to the size or the mass of the structure itself. Um, this is sort of nature's law that very small structures, such as the, is the case with microscale MEMS devices, then have very high natural resonant frequencies, which is in conflict with our goal of operating at very low bil uh, frequencies below 100 hertz. So this is the key sort of physics challenge that I'm going to describe how we overcome with, our, uh, with the device that we have developed in our group. Um, just a little bit of background in the research that our, uh, our research group has um, been conducting over even the past decade. Uh, is sort of looking at how we can harvest energy with piezoelectric elements. That is uh, essentially coupling a vibration 
of an, of an environment to, a, to gen generate mechanical deformation or strain that will then be used to accumulate electric charge and supply electric power to in the application. So the first challenge here is to go from vibrations to then strain. And uh, this was uh, sort of demonstrated with a, along, in 2004 with a, a piezo cantilever that is very narrow bandwidth and a very high excitation frequency. But it demonstrated how you could generate electric power from uh, vibrations in the environment. Next, uh, we demonst our group demonstrated how this could be done, but over a much wider bandwidth of different excitation frequencies. And this came in the form of a clamped clamped beam uh, oscillator that then was able to do that over a much wider bandwidth um, and also generate electric power from ambient vibrations. And then finally, the device that I want to talk about today is a low frequency buckled beam energy harvester that did this at then low frequencies below 100 hertz. Um, it's an array of buckled beams that uh, are excited over a very wide bandwidth of low frequencies but have sort of a low, lower power generation than expected. So I'm going to discuss a little bit the the design development of this. Um, just to sort of put this in perspective with other efforts, um, the design space that we're operating in is of the much lower frequency and it's actually state-of-the-art with respect to other energy harvesters at the MEM scale for this high bandwidth and at this low frequency. So this is, uh, we're sort of operating in that green area highlighted um, in this figure of merit with respect to power density. So today, the um, topics I'd like to cover are uh, firstly, the design and the sort of the physics of this buckled beam energy harvester. And then I want to discuss a little bit about the fabrication process, how we made these harvesters here at MTL. And then finally, the characterization, how we uh, evaluated the performance of the energy harvester and identified rooms for improvement. So first, going right into the design of the energy harvester. As I said before, linear uh, oscillate, linear resonators, they're constrained and they're coupled to the, their size because they can only resonate at uh, frequencies that correspond to their stiffness and then inversely to their mass. Um, in, on the other hand, a nonlinear oscillator, such as a buckled beam, which is the sort of the architecture of the R energy harvesting device, it's able to operate uh, by snapping uh, and oscillating but not resonating between two states of stability. Uh, this uncouples then the the uh, the constraint of the uh, the size and the mass of the device from the operating environment. So now we can use uh, MEMS scale, micro scale um, structures to then operate at these low frequencies. So what does this really mean? Um, we can we can describe a buckled beam uh, or an array of buckled beams by the Duffing equation. This sort of relates the stiffness. Uh, both a linear term of stiffness and a nonlinear term of stiffness to, to um, describe the relationship between the force and then the deflection. And then we can, from this stiffness uh, force uh, deflection relationship, we can then sort of uh, derive the energy potential of the system. And this energy potential, um, it's, it's very simple. It just has a linear and a nonlinear stiffness term that relate the deflection to then the potentials. But it's very interesting because if we plot this, this really visualizes the, uh, the sort of the physics behind the, the buckled beam energy harvester. If we plot the energy potential with respect to the deflection, uh, we can see that there's two what we call energy wells. These are two regions of stability in this plot that uh, describe the two snapping, the two regions where the buckled beam can snap in between. And they are, they are separated by what's called the energy barrier. That's that hump in the middle. And with large, very uh, large energy uh, input vibrations from the environment, then we can sort of bridge that hump and we can go between the different regions of stability and what are large amplitude, what we call interwell, interenergy well oscillations. And these large oscillations are really the ideal operating conditions for the device. This is where we have the maximum strain axially to the beams that separate that uh, connect the device frame to then the proof mass in the middle. And this really uh, enhances the piezoelectric effect where we are straining the piezoelectric elements and then harvesting um, electrical energy from those. If we do not get that magnitude of energy input from the natural, uh, from the ambient um, vibrations that we are harvesting from, then we can become trapped in an energy well and essentially just uh, oscillate without ever leaving that region of stability and then the beams are not, um, they are not strained effectively. So this large amplitude interwell oscillations is really what 
uh, sort of translates then the, the uh, ambient vibrations to a deformation and then a piezoelectrically to an electric um, response. So that's sort of the, uh, the overall architecture of how we go from those states of energy to then usable electric energy. And, um, and now I want to talk a little bit about how we physically uh, fabricate these devices, um, which we did here at um, MIT in the MTL laboratories. So the, uh, the fabrication is a, is, uh, utilizes residual stresses in materials that are deposited. Uh, residual stresses are often a challenge to overcome in microfabrication, but we actually use this property to our um, advantage. So by very carefully tuning the compressive and tensile stresses in each deposited layer, we can get a overall compressive residual stress that, release, that results in buckling of the beams that, uh, that make up the device. Um, it's balanced along the neutral axis, which is why we have so many uh, different layers. And it's, but it's overall compressive, therefore I'm um, giving the buckled nature of the device. Um, it's, as we know from anyone who has sort of worked in microfabrication, there's often a lot of significant process variance between the designed uh, device uh, parameters and then the actual fabricated uh, values of thickness um, and stress, for example. So due to the number of layers and the complexity of the process, we have a feedback loop where following each deposition, we measure the curvature of the wafer and we measure the thickness in order to estimate what the actual residual stress um, given to the material is, compare that with the design value, and then we can adjust downstream of the process how we are going to um, fine tune parameters in order to still precisely get the buckled deflection that we want, which is 200 micrometers. And so this is a, this is a uh, sort of a feedback loop that we employ after each deposition. And I really want to go briefly through the, the process um, just to illustrate uh, how this device is built. So we, we start with a, a silicon substrate. Uh, we deposit a layer of compressive thermal oxide, uh, silicon nitride with CVD, silicon oxide, also CVD. And then we spin coat a solution gel um, layer of zirconium dioxide. We photolithographically pattern that with a mask that shows the um, patterns that defines the, the, uh, the ge geometry of the beans for the device. And then we have a seed layer of lead titanate, which is also patterned similarly to define the beams. And then the active piezoelectric layer. In this case, we use the PZT is our um, active piezoelectric material. Uh, this is also a solution gel and is uh, spin coated and patterned uh, likewise. On top of the PZT, we have gold electrodes that are patterned in an in, in interdigitated uh, pattern. This is a, sort of a clasped finger type uh, pattern that is only on the top side of the PCT. This, the P PCT is operating in D33 mode where the axial strain to the PCT uh, results in the piezoelectric effect, which we only need the electrodes then on the top surface to capture. Um, oops, apologize, I hit the wrong arrow there. So we had the zirconium, the lead, the PCT, the electrodes, and then we deposit the silicon nitride uh, on top of that, silicon oxide, and then we etch down to the uh, electrode pads in order to um, uh, uncover the pads to probe a signal later. Finally, we etch all the way down to the silicon proof mass, and then from the backside, we etch to release the um, beams and the frame, which, is, which is, um, comes from the silicon wafer itself and the proof mass releasing the device itself. And the overall compressive residual stresses result in the buckled structure of the device. So this has many layers. It's a non-trivial process uh, with a lot of complexity, but it's very finely tuned to that precise buckling of 200 uh, micrometers. And this is sort of how it's built. Uh, now, in terms of characterization, how we, how we uh, evaluate the device. This is a photograph of the finished unreleased um, device. Uh, we were able to take static measurements, sort of evaluating the geometry of the device and what it looks like um, from a sort of structural perspective statically. We were also able to get a dynamic response uh, when it's in operation, and then also measure um, the power out and then identify rooms for improvement in terms of design. So statically, uh, we were able to measure with an optical profilometer the deflected, uh, the buckle deflection, which was precisely and accurately 200 micrometers. You can see this is a 3D scan of the, um, of the beams, which I find is very interesting. You see three beam selection right here on the far right, and in the middle, a, um, a complete a 3D scan of the device showing the buckle deflection. 
Um, dynamically, we tested the device by mounting to an electromagnetic shaker and testing the using a uh, laser vibrometer to measure the deflections of the central proof mass um, at different frequencies. And so this uh, dynamic evaluation showed that the proof mass was deflecting um, significantly, sort of suggesting those large interwell oscillations that we described before, where the PZT uh, elements, the piezoelectric elements are being strained healthy in a healthy way in order to generate the um, appropriate electric response. However, our power measurements, they were, they were actually state of the art for this power density and this large bandwidth and operating frequency, but they were lower than expectations and not quite what we targeted in order to power commercially um, available um, low powered sensors. And so in order to resolve the sort of um, discontinu discontinuity between the, the large deflection, but then the lower power measurements, we had to find a different metric to sort of understand why. So we took a closer look at the operation of the device. I'm gonna show a video right now. This is a, a zoomed in video of the device mounted to the electromagnetic shaker. And I've just started it and slowed down 80 times. And if you look carefully, you can, you can visualize and see that the proof mass is indeed, as the laser vibrometer measured, it is indeed deflecting or deflecting um, in and out of the plane. But the, the beams, I'm gonna restart the video, the beams themselves are not efficiently being axially strained here. And that's because this is not really a pure translation, translational uh, oscillation that we're seeing. It's, there's some pitching and there's some rolling, and there's some different modes of oscillation occurring here that are not intended. So this is, this is sort of the um, hypothesis, is that uh, we observed that similar to what the laser vibrometer told us, the central proof mass was deflecting, but we're seeing unwanted oscillatory modes. Um, in addition to the translation, which is the pure sort of up and down out of plane movement that we want, we see some rolling and pitching. And the reason for this is that we have, even in, in for MEMS scale designs, even a uh, few millimeters can result in a really high aspect ratio um, element, such as the proof mass. Um, this high aspect ratio really results, results in a high rotational inertia about the center axis. So that even small forces at the end maybe from the beams themselves, can result in then a very violent, um, at that scale, uh, pitching of the proof mass. Uh, and this results then in a sort of uncontrolled uh, oscillation that doesn't efficiently translate the way that we want it, snapping cleanly between two uh, stable states. Um, and so the uh, most recent sort of development here was optimizing the proof mass by a redesign and sort of based on the hypothesis that the high rotational inertia was the reason for this um, uh, uncontrolled sort of movement. We centralized the um, distribution of the proof mass at the very center by creating a pocketed geometry so that we can still uh, bind the, the device frame to the central proof mass with the piezoelectric beams, but we then centralized the mass at the middle. Um, and with the help of Dr. Lee's group, we were um, up until the closure of MIT or M MTL and I guess the campus as well, um, we were fabricating these new devices with the new uh, geometry that had the centralized proof mass. And that's sort of where this research um, concludes in terms of uh, the fabrication and the um, redesign efforts. Um, but our, our research goes on. So there's a new direction I just want to spend one slide talking about, and that is uh, how we can use machine learning to optimize this type of very complex um, early stage design. And the motivating questions behind our group's sort of new direction in, uh, in this uh, in research is how we can use machine learning methods to sort of capture um, design, a um, very complex, complex design so that we can then store it in a computer or in a machine and then do some manipulations, different evaluations, um, and then re retrieve it and represent it to um, engineers later. Um, basically, essentially, how can we capture um, the complex process that I've just described um, so that several years from now, another ex after sort of the experts that sort of over the past decade of research have developed this technology, after they have sort of become not available, how can we capture these design, uh, this design knowledge so that it can be represented for people in the future? And that's sort of the new direction um, of, our, of our research. But uh, sort of wrapping up, I just want to touch on some of the key points that I hope you'll be able to take away from this. And that is when we are uh, sort of identifying ways to uh, harvest low frequency vibrations, we were able to uh, then use a nonlinear oscillator architecture that really uncoupled the size constraint so we could use MEMS technology to do 
uh, low frequency energy harvesting. And this resulted in a state-of-the-art energy harvester at this very large bandwidth and low frequency um, uh, uh, energy device that was um, produced. And, uh, but finally, by sort of uh, finding more accurate metrics for uh, assessing the performance of the device, that being not just relying on a simple uh, linear measurement of a movement of a mass, but rather more sort of holistically uh, analyzing the behavior of the device and um, identifying those oscillation modes that were not uh, wanted and then identifying rotational inertia as the key, we were able to sort of identify an area for improvement. So this is a photograph of the final device. Um, we have a number of documentation and literature on this topic that I know this will be recorded, but I'd be happy to pass on some of these uh, documents if they, are, they would be helpful. And I'd like to then conclude my presentation and yield my time back to Professor Bulovich um, to then take any questions at this point. I'd like to thank everyone for, for joining. Hello, Kat. Thank you very, very much. Uh, it was a fantastic talk. Um, indeed, uh, the progress of technology never stops. And I love the fact that you were able to portray to us uh, uh, the advancements that you have made and yet also put, leave open a set of unanswered questions. Because uh, I think there are clearly a multitude of ways of uh, addressing this. Um, so at this point, uh, I would ask uh, if uh, there are any questions, if you do have questions, please either uh, raise your hand uh, and I will hopefully notice you and call upon you. Uh, more readily, you can send uh, a chat uh, to me or to everyone and I will do my very best to uh, indeed relay your question uh, to uh, Halut. Um, so to uh, get us started, uh, the, uh, the choice clearly of silicon technologies obviously beneficial as it allows you to utilize all of the other processes that one can imagine already existing thanks to the semiconductor processing infrastructure that's well developed. Um, however, uh, if you were to imagine uh, using uh, different material sets, would there be a better choice than uh, silicon in this case uh, in order to generate these low frequency type systems? Yes, of course. Um, that's, I mean, that's, that really points to another um, branch of research that we've investigated. And that is, um, this is more on the, on the MEMS scale, sort of, you know, as you said, the silicon-based um, MEMS technology for energy harvesting. We've also looked at, and this is more at the meso scale of methods where sort of uh, human movement can be harvested for the same purpose of translating uh, low frequency, um, you know, vibrations and signals into energy harvesting. And, um, and there's a lot of wearable technology out there, um, but the challenge there is sort of at the low frequency combining uh, or sort of bridging the, uh, the low frequency impulses into a sort of continuously uh, generated uh, electric um, sort of signal out. So we have, a, we have a, um, some research on where we can translate the human footstep into airflow that can then be continuously harvested by micro turbines. Um, very small microscale turbines that can then uh, and essentially just power a DC motor or it's a generator essentially and create an electrical signal that way. So there's, there's many different options, as you said, to um, sort of ident attack this problem. And, um, and this is just one of those. All right. Uh, any other questions for Haluk? Because uh, I can keep on going. <laughs> please, uh, please do bring them in, uh, send them my way. Um, the, uh, the specific design of uh, the Preza micro harvester uh, is uh, indeed uses a set of uh, uh, strings, call it, that hold the middle weight that you have indeed uh, provided. Uh, the design of those strings clearly is very important in both determining the stretchability, the Young's modulus, if you want to go on the system. Um, why choose the present design? Uh, is there, and also the directionality, you have chosen it to make them uh, go uh, perfectly out as opposed to fan out so that they can maybe prevent some of those rolling pitching modes that uh, you indeed are observing. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, so this is, this is sort of an iteration on a um, more simplified device design that uh, really um, sort of hits up against the different constraints that we're working with. And the goal here is to produce as much electric power as we can from the small uh, footprint that we have. And so ideally we would have as much piezoelectric as, as much piezoelectric mass as we can um, in that small area. 
And so originally we did have uh, a sort of piezoelectric sheet that was coupling the central proof mass all the way to the device frame. And this maximized the, um, the footprint of the piezoelectric material and theoretically would maximize then the, the um, efficiency of the device. Um, the problem with this is at the very sort of high residual stresses that give us the um, ability to have that buckled structure, we had this sort of uh, wrinkling in the thin films of that membrane where it would itself, it would have a wrinkled um, surface and it would not be able to at sort of a static uh, um, static, um, you know, just like s sitting by itself, it would not be able to maintain that um, that uh, that straight uh, structure, and it would be uh, sort of wrinkled and very contorted. And so we had these reliefs, uh, which resulted in that buckled the strings, as you say, you know, the buckled um, or the the beams, sort of like almost a suspension bridge, you know, the the suspended mass like that. Um, and so that's sort of the origin of that design. Um, that's not to say that this is exhausted the design space by any means. There's all sorts of different spiral geometries that um, can be explored um, to sort of further, uh, you know, stabilize the mass and, and minimize those, um, those uh, sort of unwanted oscillation modes, as you said. But that's sort of the, where, where the rationale behind the current design. All right, a question from the chat um, by uh, Anne Faran. Uh, in the structure component, um, Lead is a toxic elemental compound that is, uh, what is its primary purpose of lead and what are the options for the substitute? Exactly, right, um, that's, that's a great point, um, especially if we're considering wearables or something that would interact with a human or a living thing. Um, we, have, we have two layers, I believe, that have lead. So we have the lead titanate, which is the seed layer that sort of insulates the, uh, the piezoelectric layer from the um, layers below. And then we have the, the, the most important layer, actually, the PZT itself, the lead zirconate titanate. Um, and that, that is a toxic material. The reason why it was chosen above other um, piezoelectric materials um, is that it is the highest PLS, piezoelectric coefficient of most materials. And so at this sort of stage in the research, we are maximizing the efficiency of the energy that we are sort of able to harvest during operation. So that's why this, um, you know, this, this, uh, this material with these drawbacks was selected. Um, but going forward, you know, if we are sort of looking at wearables, other piezoelectric uh, materials will definitely be considered to eliminate that toxic or further insulate the toxic uh, nature of that material. Okay. Um, so another question. Um, is it correct that the efficiency of nonlinear piezoelectric is lower as compared to the linear one? Uh, and to this point, would it be more beneficial to make a linear resonator and harvest higher frequencies and then convert them uh, electronically uh, to lower frequencies. Excellent talk, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, so, so this is a uh, this is a good point. Um, the The constraint that we're operating in here is that the uh, the design requirement is that we are not sort of able to modulate the input frequencies, and so we are considering sort of a worst case scenario where we do not have these high frequencies that are, you know, very, that are able to be harvested very efficiently um, available. And we have, we don't really have a isolated frequency either. It's a very organic source of many different uh, frequencies at the lower end of the spectrum um, with a very large bandwidth. So that, you know, if, if as the um, question states, if it were the case that we had a single uh, resonant frequency that we could sort of target for this, um, Apologies, the phone is ringing. Um, for this, um, for this effect, then we could target that. Um, but we actually, you know, if we're talking about fluid flow or you know cars moving by a roadway in a remote region, we really can't um, sort of uh, uh, target just one very high frequency. We have to sort of um, this. That's sort of the defining problem is is the low wide bandwidth frequencies available. Excellent. Well, Haluk, uh, thank you again for giving us an exceptionally good talk. Um, I, I very much thank you for have, giving us a chance to see this field uh, being illuminated through your uh, explanations. I do uh, 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 wish you uh, success as you are completing your senior experience, uh, senior graduate student experience, and uh, head towards your completion of your thesis. Uh, with that, I would uh, like one more time just to provide my reaction uh, to this talk. Uh, and uh, to uh, invite everyone uh, to join us again uh, on Thursday, uh, this coming week, or this week uh, at 11 o'clock uh, for the next rendition of the Nano Explorations. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, and if you do have any questions, do not hesitate to send them to me or to Halut Akai directly, and uh, the conversation can continue.
again, thanks a lot for being here today. Thank you. Bye-bye.